Good morning in the UK and good evening in Australia. Chamber is delighted to partner with the Department of International Trade for a third webinar discussing another facet of the new Australia Free Trade Agreement. And today we, we will talk about the ambitious services provisions agreed in the recently signed UK Australia Free, Free Trade Agreement directly from the agreement services negotiators. And we'll cover the agreement's chapters on cross-border trade in services, professional business services and mobility. So the cross-border trade in services is associated with the annexes outlined in the market access and treatment that the FTA guarantees to British businesses, providing long-term certainty and the transparency for service suppliers exporting to and operating in the Australian market. The professional business services chapter contains provisions that seek to address barriers to trade related professional services and the recognition of professional qualifications. And mobility contains certain provisions that bind visa arrangements for highly skilled business people. This ensures greater certainty and new access for temporary business travel between the UK and Australia. Now, today we have four excellent speakers. Um, our first uh, speaker, Matthew McKee, is a Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Officer at DIT, and he works in the UK Australia FT negotiations team as a Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Manager. And prior to this role, Matt acted as the Logistics Lead for the UK New Zealand FTA negotiations. And he previously worked on the Trade Agreement Continuity Programme. Uh, our second speaker is Peter Cade. He is Head of Canada and Australia Cross-Border Trade and Services, and he led the Cross-Border Trade and Services chapter for the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Peter worked in the Trade Agreement, Trade Agreement Continuity Programme, which sought to replicate the effects of the EU trade agreements for the UK following the end of the transition period. Uh, John Carroll is the Head of Professional Services Policy and Negotiations, and he led the negotiations on professional services in the, in the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. And prior to this, John worked at the Ministry of Justice. And Amy Slay is the Head of Mobility Policy and Strategy at the Department of International Trade. Um, and she has, um, has taken over responsibility for the temporary entry chapter uh, on the FTA and its final stages. And prior to this, Amy was Deputy Chapter Lead for Investment in the UK EU FTA at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So welcome our, uh, our speakers today. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting and exciting topic. And certainly the free trade agreement is, is one that's very um, relevant to all our people in the audience. Um, so thank you uh, to our audience today. And I welcome Matt McKee uh, to kick off this uh, webinar. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Joe. And uh, yeah, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're joining us from Australia. Uh, before we dive in to kind of the policy specifics of this agreement, which I'm sure you're all very excited to hear about, I thought it'd be helpful if I was to get us underway with some uh, a brief recap of where we are with this agreement and their kind of next steps that are on the horizon. So uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, on the 16th of December last year, uh, we were able to sign the agreement that was signed by the Department for International Trade, Secretary of State, Anne-Marie uh, Trevelyan and her Australian counterpart, Dan Tihan at a virtual signing ceremony. Uh, this was the culmination of months, uh, if not years of hard work and it's something we were really, really happy to get done uh, just in the run up to Christmas. That was a nice little present. Um, this is the first agreement the UK has negotiated from scratch since leaving the EU. And it's something that is tailored specifically to uh, some of the key strengths in British industry, including our, our services sector. Uh, the team will go into more details exactly how it's tailored um, a wee bit later on. Um, hopefully you're all aware of this, but if you're not, all the agreement text is available on gov.uk. Uh, alongside a, a range of explainer documents which set out some of the key information about the agreement. So if you haven't already, I would, I would strongly recommend that you check out GovDUK for that information. Um, as I've said, although we reached signature in December, this very much isn't the end of the FTA process, um, not the end of our journey at all. 
uh, before the agreement can be brought into force, it must first undergo a, a fairly comprehensive and thorough scrutiny process. Uh, this process is underway. And as we speak, the agreement is being uh, closely investigated by the Trades and Agricultural Commission, uh, commonly known as the TAC. Uh, this commission is sort of exploring the agricultural impact specifically of the agreement, uh, and it will produce uh, an independent set of advice, uh, which will then be submitted to the government and will inform the writing of a report under Section 42 of the Agricultural Bill. Um, Alongside this, there's also room for various committees, including the International Trade Committee and the International Agreements Committee in the House of Lords to scrutinize this agreement further. Um, once the committees and commissions have taken a look at the agreement, we will then be in a position to publish the Section 42 report and the tax advice in Parliament for everyone to see. Um, and we'll then move on to the next stage of the process, which is laying the agreement text uh, in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act. So this scrutiny process, this stage of the scrutiny process, I should say, will last for a minimum of 21 sitting days and will give parliamentarians in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords ample time to uh, explore and uh, investigate this deal thoroughly to see its impact and ensure it is uh, in the best interest of the UK, which we very strongly believe that it is. Um, once this uh, CRAG process is completed, we will then need to introduce some primary and secondary legislative uh, legislation uh, to implement the agreement properly. Uh, this will be passed in, in the usual parliamentary way. I, I won't bore you all to death with the details on that specifically, uh, but suffice to say it is a, a fairly uh, uh, comprehensive process that will take uh, some amount of time, uh, of course. This is only one side of the coin, and whilst all of the UK's processes are being carried out, uh, our partners in Australian government will be doing a very similar thing. I, I must confess I'm not an expert on the Australian parliamentary process, but I understand it is somewhat similar. Um, so once both sides, the UK and Australia, have completed their scrutiny processes, the agreement will be then be uh, considered ratified, and we will be in a position to bring it into force, uh, at which point all businesses in the UK and Australia will be able to benefit fully from some of the exciting things that we've agreed uh, in these negotiations. And we're really very much looking forward to that, as I, as I hope you are too. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to pass over to uh, Pete Cade, who will be able to speak through some of the more specific policy information uh, that we can find in this agreement. Thank you, Matt. Um, that's really helpful. Um, and yes, again, as, as Matt said, good morning, everyone in the UK and afternoon to those of you in Australia. Um, and told by the sort of grey windows behind me, it's very much morning here in South London. Um, but I'm delighted to sort of be here um, and uh, speak to you today and see the interest in this event. Um, I think on a personal level, um, after sort of slogging away on this so long and doing the negotiations entirely in my uh, living room, it's great to be able to sort of discuss, get, get out there and sort of discuss this, even if the game is things virtually. Um, I'm also quite a big believer that um, within the civil service, we need to be doing what we can to drum awareness to the agreements um, and selling the benefits of them so they can be utilised. I think there's, there's always a risk that we sort of just get on a treadmill of sort of, you know, finished project, next project, lock away dusty documents and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm really pleased that um, can be here today. Um, as Matt mentioned, uh, and Joe mentioned, um, I led the closing of the cross-border trade and services chapter, along with a really good team, um, and also their speakers who cover the sectoral areas we're also covering today. Um, unfortunately, uh, my colleague Danny Turner couldn't make it today, um, so I'll be covering transport and uh, delivery service provisions as well. Uh, but please bear with me on this, as it's certainly not my expertise, so I may take, take some questions away. But let's crack on. Uh, so trade and services with, with Australia, um, and apologies, uh, but I will sort of run through some stats first. Um, but the reason we have so many people uh, working on this and keen to speak about it is due to its value. So uh, UK was uh, Australia's third largest trading services provider in 2020, uh, representing 49% of UK's total trade with Australia in 2020. Um, which was worth 6.9 billion despite the COVID pandemic. Uh, and this was 9.2 billion pounds in uh, 2019. So obviously drop off 
and hoping that the agreement can help sort of rebuild those, those trading links. Um, so yeah, put simply, you know, this, this sort of our trade service relationship is, is a big deal, and if we, we can do to support it, we will. And that's obviously before we get into sort of societal links and soft power links that we benefit from things like enhanced mobility between our countries. But coming on to the, um, the text of the agreement, uh, the CPS chapter and the annexes that I work, worked on, um, they outline market access and treatment that the FTA guarantees of businesses uh, when they're operating in the each other's markets. The aim of this being to provide very long-term certainty and transparency for services suppliers exporting to and operating in both markets. So perhaps whereas we would say tariffs, um, it's very much entry into force on day one and you sort of straight away see uh, the change in the conditions for trading and it's very binary, um, I would anticipate it will take longer to see the benefits of the service agreements in this agreement, as it's about establishing the very long-term conditions for services trade. And sort of the way I see it is that CBTS chapter provides that cross-border trade services chapter, provides the foundational commitments on which to sort of specific sectoral commitments around special services or maritime services can be built, built on from. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have sort of the, the way we structure it, we have the core agreement text, which is the sort of chapter that I work on, and that outlines the commitments I mentioned. And then there's a schedule of reservations, which outlines where two countries reserve against those commitments in specific areas. And this brings me on to what I see as one of the main, uh, sort of the, 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 one of the most significant parts of the CBS chapter and plus sectoral areas. So Australia for the first time has provided a negative listing of reservations at the federal and sub-federal level of government. This means that commitments in this chapter apply to all services at both levels of government and are specifically stated. Um, and on the UK side, we sort of see this as, as our most liberal market access offer we provided in an FTA. Now, I think this might sound a bit odd that we're celebrating more detail around reservations and exceptions to the agreement. Um, and I sort of understand that, but again, I think what I come back to is this point around certainty and planning for service providers. So, for instance, were we not to have this FDA, um, this bilateral FDA, and instead of seek to trade with Australia uh, or Australia with the UK on CPTPP terms, as we as we're UK are acceding to this and Australia members, there wouldn't be this level of commitment or detail as uh, Australia only reserves at the federal level. So, again, it's about providing that long-term certainty and stability for service suppliers. This is also further supported by a so-called standstill clause in a non-conforming non measures article. This provision means that both countries can't introduce less liberal or more protectionist measures than are permitted to. So again, baking that certainty of what trading conditions will be for service suppliers in the long term. And we've also um, sought to enhance transparency commitments in the core text of the agreement. So again, this is within a chapter. So domestic regulation commitments go beyond previous UK and Australia multilateral and bilateral commitments. This means that suppliers can easily access and be informed by transparent and fair processes, licensing, for instance. So for instance, real estate or wine distribution. I quite often come back to wine distribution. I'm not quite sure. I'm sure there's a reason. Um, this will so this will help ensure that uh, unless say bureaucracy doesn't get in the way of firms operating in the UK um, or Australia and makes it more attractive for service exporters to enter into each other's markets. Um, another example of this is commitments on transparency concerning authorization fees. These go further than what's been agreed by Australia and the UK at the WTO. This means that if you're seeking to establish a consultancy business, then all fees associated with the process will be made, be made public. Um, and I think probably a final point I wanted to make on the CVS chapter is um, what we're really pleased about is um, oh, I'm just seeing some comments on the uh, oh, sorry, one. Well, uh, Lots to get through, so uh, apologies for uh, going, going so fast there. Um, excellent. So yeah, the final point I wanted to make really on the um, uh, cross-border trade and service chapter was around um, uh, the amount of service suppliers who will benefit from this chapter. Um, so this is more than in, in, in any other previous UK FTA. Um, due to the inclusion of branches um, of companies and permanent residents in the scope of the chapter. So we're sort of broadening the impact of the agreement uh, to service suppliers. So yeah, I think overall we're confident that this delivers a really good package of commitments, providing greater transparency and legal certainty for UK service suppliers operating in Australian markets uh, than certainly the UK's has provided for in an FTA. Um, and hopefully, as I mentioned, this is all about establishing those trading conditions Hopefully, we'll make the growth of our services trade very stronger 
um, and bounce back from the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, I think we are doing questions at the end, so please do put them in a sidebar, um, and I'll also come on to those later. Um, but I will sort of shortly and briefly move on to transport and uh, delivery services. I think firstly, um, just to touch on some stats around here. Uh, so in 2020, uh, UK exported £572 million worth of transport service to Australia. Um, so it's certainly a sector we're very keen to support and build on. Um, and I'll sort of make this into aviation and maritime improvements. So we've got some very, really strong and ambitious outcomes for the aviation sector here. Uh, for example, the UK and Australia have made reciprocal commitments to cover aircraft uh, for routine and maintenance service carried out on aircraft between flights for the first time in a scope of service commitments. So, um, again, we're sort of speaking about uh, expanding and enhancing commitments for long term planning for service suppliers. I think this is a big part of this. Um, again, this ensures that uh, suppliers have guaranteed market access and fair treatment compared to each other's uh, suppliers. And again, links back to about, uh, the standstill clause I mentioned earlier. So there can't be any rollback now on those commitments. Uh, we've also agreed annex to the CBDS chapter um, on maritime services. This supports shipping companies and flag vessels when operating in both markets. This, I understand, is unprecedented for Australia um, and its strongest guarantees they have given in an FTA on maritime. Uh, the annex ensures that companies and vessels receive fair treatment in accessing ports and port services, uh, can move empty coin containers between ports and supply feeder services. These provisions will provide legal certainty uh, to support uh, the maritime services uh, relationship between UK and Australia. And I do understand that it's potentially getting a bit niche to talk about sort of empty containers and moving that around. So I just want to touch on why that's quite a useful example. So the ability to reposition containers between ports is important for shipping companies and can generate cost savings because it means that uh, vessels are not required to subcontract the movement of their cont empty containers within the other parties' um, uh, market, domestic suppliers, or use land transport to do so. So we're sort of seeing links here between the, um, the, goods, the goods trade side of things and also um, the services side. Um, and also, again, the interlinkages with the CVS chapter because then you're getting into how is the sort of shipping companies or how, how are they treated um, when they're sort of operating within each other's markets. So, sort of very quickly, you get into um, the, the sort of the agreement working together and, and, and that's sort of one thing, basically. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll sort of leave it there on maritime stuff. Um, we've also agreed. Uh, obligations on delivery services, which again is potentially more niche, but I think it's worth touching upon very quickly. Um, so uh, we've uh, agreed with Australia um, that uh, UK suppliers on delivery service can do so on a level playing field. Uh, so for instance, uh, ensuring that Australia Post and the UK's Royal Mail do not subsidise their non-monopoly and non-universal obligation services, and that neither market places unfair requirements on each other's service suppliers when operating in the market and that Australia's postal monopoly and UK universal services obligations are clearly defined. Now, I'll be honest with you, on, this last, uh, on that last point, I'm less certain on that. So if there are questions on sort of uh, postal monopolies, I may have to take this away. Um, but I will stop there before I get further stuck in sort of niche detail and sort of uh, individual provisions and articles. But please do sort of put questions in the sidebar um, and we can sort of come on to those in the um, panel session later on. Um, in the meantime, I will hand over to John um, to talk us through the professional services side of things. Thanks, Pete. And yeah, likewise, echo the sentiments about being, um, you know, very glad to be here and to, to speak with, with lots of you today. So I'm going to cover the professional services chapter in the agreement um, and just a few initial reflections on, on the sector and, and what it means to both the UK and Australian economy. Clearly, a hugely um, significant economic powerhouse, I think in the UK, it's the second or third largest export uh, services sector behind financial services. Uh, and it's a really key facilitator of, of activity in the wider economy. You know, you can't build hospitals, uh, you can't fly planes without qualified doctors, engineers, pilots, all these sorts of things. Uh, and so professional services, you know, it's not just taking place within a vacuum, but, but very much key to um, the overall success of, of other areas as well. It's a, it's a highly regulated sector for, again, thinking about engineers, lawyers, doctors, these are all very 
um, highly skilled, complex professions that require really stringent regulation, both at federal level and, and at sub-federal level in the UK and, and, and in Australia. And, and regulators who have the, the power to oversee regulation have a very clear set of objectives around maintaining standards, protecting consumers, ensuring that there aren't sort of races to the bottom. And, and as a result, I think really important to, to make clear at the start that the intersection between professional services, regulation, and, and FTAs is quite complex. And, and there is a, a delicate balance between being ambitious, you know, seeking to drive progress within the FTAs, whilst also ensuring that regulators maintain their autonomy to take decisions on the standards for entry into, into a profession or, or decisions on whether an individual has the right skills, knowledge and expertise uh, to meet those standards. But, but within that context, uh, just to touch on what the professional services chapter does and, and the key outcomes. Uh, firstly, it's, it's the, 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 the first chapter that the UK or Australia have agreed on professional services. Often in other trade agreements, you will see uh, the professional services content as an annex to the cross-border trade and services chapter. Uh, we've created a standalone chapter to help signal the importance of the sector for both our economies, uh, with provisions that cover a wide variety of issues reflecting and the importance of this sector. All, all professions are within the scope of, of the chapter, and, and this broad scope allows uh, regulated professions, but also uh, bodies that are self-regulated. So in the UK, we will call them you know, for example, chartered professions like the chartered accountants, uh, engineers, which aren't professions that are regulated in law, but are, are self-regulated and sort of govern their own standards. And, and those professions are within scope, which, which helps to create a really maximist uh, approach. So this includes professions such as architecture, accounting, audit, and, and engineering. And the first key outcome is on recognition of professional qualifications. So that the chapter will help facilitate the recognition of UK and Australian professional qualifications uh, and support work towards mutual recognition arrangements, which could remove the need for both the UK and Australian professionals to sit burdensome exams in order to requalify. And we know this is a really important thing for individuals. If you take the, you know, the, the, the case study of a, of a mid-career professional who needs to relocate to either the UK or Australia, may have a family with them, maybe you know, 10, 10 years into their career, they don't want to have to undergo um, you know, lots of exams to pay a huge amount of fees in order to do that process. It's really helpful if, if things are streamlined and transparent. Um, so these provisions are, are in place to help encourage progress on, on recognition. And, and we think that key professions could benefit such as lawyers, architects, engineers, the, the likes that I've mentioned already, and, and really help to create opportunities for professionals whilst allowing UK and Australian companies to attract and, and retain that global talent, which plays into some of the, the commitments that Amy will discuss in mobility in a few minutes. Now, just reflecting on, on what I mentioned at the start about regulators and their autonomy, of course, progress on RPQ, which is recognition of professional qualifications, will primarily be driven by collaboration between regulatory and accreditation bodies. So, for example, the, the various law societies from across the UK, working with their counterparts at the Law Council of Australia, and the commitments in the text between governments will help support that, that dialogue and facilitate those discussions. It's very, very important to say that these provisions don't in them themselves curate, create arrangements for recognition, and that is the responsibility of, of relevant regulators. And instead, they are about encouraging best practice whilst respecting that, that autonomy of the regulators. The second key outcome is on legal services, and you'll have probably spotted through the, the UK's recent precedent, um, the emergence of specific provisions on, on legal services, home title practice. And what, what these provisions do is, is ensure that UK lawyers and Australian lawyers have certainty and clarity about their ability to give legal advice on home, foreign and international law using their, their home title and qualifications. So, the example is, uh, you know, an England and Welsh qualified lawyer advising a multinational client in, in Sydney on a matter of English contract law using their title as a solicitor in England and Wales. And, and the situation, you know, that also applies to an Australian lawyer coming to the UK, a Scots lawyer going to Western Australia. It's, it's, uh, it has full coverage across both the UK and Australia. And this includes uh, arbitration, conciliation and mediation services. 
it, it's quite an esoteric approach, uh, but it reflects the unique structure of legal services and, and the specific nature of the profession where there is a, a clear delineation between domestic legal services, you know, the likes of, of family law um, appearing before the court and, and legal services and international law, which is about big business, um, you know, companies wanting to, to agree contracts with each other and, and locking that certainty into the agreement we think is good for that 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 big economic piece. Um, you know, we aren't interested um, through these free trade agreements in trying to encroach on that domestic system, and, and uh, you know that that's certainly something that we respect. Now, again, th these commitments don't confer any automatic rights to recognition for for both Australian and UK lawyers wanting to practice in each other's countries, um, but they do provide guarantees about the kind of treatment these lawyers would expect when they are providing legal advisory services. In foreign and international law. The, the one bit of the legal services piece that I'm you know, really proud of is the, the set of groundbreaking commitments on regulatory dialogue, um, which establishes a structured engagement between the UK and Australian legal professions. So that regulatory dialogue will, will be professional-led with the aim of sharing expertise and remaining and addressing remaining behind the border barriers, such as those relating to requalification. And the final element I'll touch on is, is around the, the professional services working group. So you're probably asking, well, it's all well and good having these provisions that encourage X, Y, Z and, and try to bring regulators together to discuss issues on RPQ. But how, how do you maintain the impetus and, and ensure momentum isn't lost? Well, what, we, what we've agreed in the text is, is a professional services working group, which really is there to help drive momentum and to use the slipstream of the FTA as a way of supporting onward discussions around behind the border barriers that affect professional services. So behind the border barriers you know, are, are most relevant in the relationship between the UK and Australia, where you already have a very good long established relationship. Market access is good. It isn't difficult to get into the market, but it's behind the border barriers, such as those relating to licensing, qualification requirements that, that do you know, slow down progress and, and create a bit of friction in the system. So with the, with the ambition of addressing these behind the border barriers um, and working with regulators, this professional services working group uh, embeds a framework that helps to drive progress, recognizing that you know, a lot of that needs to be driven um, hand in hand with relevant regulators and professional bodies, but having a, a framework in place helps to avoid sort of new barriers arising um, and address the existing ones wherever that's possible. And that professional services working group um, has a, a clear link into the legal services regulatory dialogue and, and there's a, a very clear commitment that ensures the working group is supporting the regulatory dialogue and, and the regulatory dialogue is, is providing updates and, and uh, is really helping to push forward with, with discussions that overall might lead to a mutual recognition arrangement for, for the legal services sector. So I will, I will pause there, that, that's just to sort of cover the three outcomes of, of RPQ legal services and professional services working group, and, and hopefully that, that's been helpful. Um, I think we'll take questions near the end of the session, but uh, otherwise I'd be happy to pass on to, to Amy in a moment. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, John, and thanks to um, Pete also for a great overview, and thank you everyone for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, so as Joanne said out at the beginning, I'm here to talk about uh, mobility. So by that, we mean the temporary entry chapter and the associated annexes. And these contain provisions that bind business mobility arrangements for highly skilled business persons to ensure greater certainty and also to create new access um, between the UK and Australian market. Um, just as an overview, it doesn't um, relate to um, general labour market or permanent uh, general labour market access or permanent migration. This is um, solely about temporary movement only. And temporary can be anything from a day or two to a couple of years. Um, so quite a big sort of difference there. And mobility is a very um, key part of trade and services. Um, in 2019, uh, UK mobility trade um, with Australia was worth uh, 9, 947 million, and it's a key facilitator of um, other parts of services trade, including um, the area set out uh, earlier by Pete. Um, so just as a general 
overview, uh, this is an ambitious package, a very ambitious um, services package, uh, as well as an ambitious mobility package. And um, for the first time, um, Australian businesses uh, will no longer have to prove they cannot find an Australian locally um, to temporary su supply a service in order to sponsor a UK professional to do that role. Um, also, for the first time, uh, UK service suppliers, including architects, scientists, researchers, lawyers and accountants, will be able to apply for temporary work visas in Australia without being subject to Australia's changing skilled um, occupation list. Um, so currently, uh, you have to be on a list to um, apply for those visas and that list changes very frequently um, when this deal is implemented. Um, many sectors will have bound in access, so greater certainty they will never come off, that access will always be available. This is also um, the largest um, amount of people will benefit from this deal, so uh, for the first time in a UK bilateral FTA we have included permanent residents, um, so UK nationals as well as permanent residents as, and Australian nationals as well as Australian permanent residents will be able to benefit from the terms. And all business persons in the agreement are supported by commitments to seek greater transparency and uh, improving the visa application processes. So there's lots of provisions around um, what does good look like in visa processing? What sort of information should be available? Um, how should applications be processed? So hopefully that will also improve the business environment and make it much easier um, to enter each market. Just to go into some of the commitments on the categories of business persons. So um, Australian business persons will be able to um, visit the UK um, and undertake, uh, as businesses as they will be able to undertake um, activities including meetings and consult uh, consultations, sales, they can go to trade fairs, um, they can take part in after lease services. Um, and they'll be able to stay for a period of 90 days in a six month period. Um, there will also be a 90 day um, and six months for business visitors who are looking to come to the UK in order to establish a commercial presence. Australia have made a very um, a similar commitment to the UK um, for our business visitors. So UK business visitors going to Australia, um, they can expect to be allowed to stay between three and six months, depending on the type of activity. Um, but the activities are very similar. So um, going to establish a, um, a commercial presence, um, negotiating um, sales and um, installing and maintaining um, certain parts of equipment. We also have um, ambitious commitments on intercorporate transferees. So those are individuals who um, are transferring from one location um, to another location of their country, uh, their company. So perhaps um, they are based in a UK company and there's a um, Australian branch and they transfer over there. So um, for UK intercorporate transferees going to Australia, um, they will benefit from an increase, increased length of stay. So they will now be able to stay in Australia for four years. That is an increase of two years. Um, and they will also be able to take with them their partners and dependents and partners and dependents will be given working rights. So they will be able to work at, during their time in Australia. Um, Australian intercorporate transferees coming to the UK, um, if they're a manager, they can stay for three years. Um, if they're a specialist, they can also stay for three years. If they are a graduate trainee, um, so we are allowing, we are binding in access for graduate trainees. So those on um, corporate grad schemes, they can stay for one year. Um, the UK is also allowing um, partner independent entry rights, um, but only partners are guaranteed working rights, so not dependent children. And we have also committed in that category to a 90 day visa processing time. So that is the absolute ceiling um, of how long it will take to process your visa. It can take less, but it cannot take longer. The UK also makes a commitment on investors. So we um, guarantee um, if you meet all the, the criteria and you apply for the correct channels, that investors can stay for up to one year and they can access all sectors um, of the UK economy. Australian 
um, make a similar deal um, an offer they call their category independent executives but it's essentially very similar it's essentially the same thing as our investors category they are allowing UK independent executives to come into Australia to establish a business for up to four years um, and that is all sectors and the partner independent working and entry rights are also included on that we also make ambitious commitments on contractual service suppliers. So um, for UK um, service suppliers going to Australia, they can stay um, for between four years um, in some categories. Um, of those are still subject to the changing skilled occupation list, um, but, the, um, but there is at least a six months and 12 months um, length of stay um, for 29 sectors so those ones are bound in they aren't subject to the changing list and they will always have access um, also for independent professionals so those who are um, going to australia to perform a service through contract but are independently employed so self-employed and not employed for an entity um, they can expect to stay for six months in any 12 month period with um in nine at uh, 19 sectors bound um, but they are required to have six years prior experience within that field um, to prove that they are, are, are appropriately high skills um, for Australians going to the UK um, so contractual service suppliers those who work for an organization under contract um, they can stay for 12 months in any 24 month period and we have bound um, 30 sectors um, so those 30 sectors will always have access under the FTA and three years prior experience is required also to sort of indicate um, the level of expertise and high skill and for independent professionals so those who are um, self-employed they can um, also stay for 12 months in any 24 month period six years prior experience and have 16 sectors bound into the agreement. So just outside of the FTA, some of you might be aware that we have also um, agreed an ambitious uh, memorandum of understanding um, on mobility, um, which is obviously separate to the FTA, but sits alongside it. And one of the big, um, the big parts of it is the changes to the UK's youth mobility scheme and Australia's um, working holiday maker scheme. So these are existing schemes that we have agreed that we will change. So essentially, we are raising the age for that. So instead of it being um, cut off post 30, it will now be from 18 to 35 inclusive. Um, and Brits can go to Australia for three years. Um, Australians can come to the UK for three years. Um, previously um, and, and still currently until changes are implemented um, to get a, a visa past the one year point in Australia you have to undertake um, specified types of work which often includes farm work. Um, we have agreed with Australia that for Brits this requirement will no longer be in place um, so following implementation Brits can go to Australia and stay for that three year period without having to undertake farm work. So this is a real win and something um, that is not offered to other countries. So it's a real special case. Um, on top of that, um, within the memorandum of understanding, Australia have also offered the UK a unilateral pilot on in innovation and early skills. Um, so we're, we're still waiting further information on that. Um, but broadly, it will be some sort of scheme that facilitates um, those in early stages of their career going to Australia or those who work in innovation um, sectors. So that's everything for me. Hopefully uh, that was a, a reasonable overview. Um, I will hand back to Joanne now, who I think will take us into the Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amy, and thank you to Peter and John and um, Matt. Um, thank you for your um, expertise on this in this area. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions. We have got some questions from the floor. If you want to ask any questions, please uh, enter them in the Q and A um, button on your screens. But the um, the first question we have 
is uh, from Catherine Brims, the Law Society of England and Wales. Hello, Catherine. Um, thank you for the interesting session, she says, and we're very excited about the legal services provisions. Um, I understand that many UK citizen solicitors um, of e &W that look to undertake work in Australia for two to four years will use the temporary skills shortage visa, subclass 482 visa. Do the new commitments in Annex 4 extend to cover this subclass? Great. So I think that's a question for me. Um, so broadly, um, that route will still be available, um, but the commitments in which Australia have made to the UK will be um, facilitated through technically a new route. Um, that's sort of the more techie details, but essentially, um, ultimately, um, solicitors will actually be able to access the, the routes under the FTA, but they'll also still be able to um, access the route that you're referring to. Um, so it's just giving uh, greater options, really. Um, and we've got bound access in the FTA if anything was to change in um, what was on the, um, the shortage visa list. Thank you, Amy. Um... Now, this is one for you, John. John, thank you for your insights. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, regarding professional services, uh, specifically law, when can we anticipate mutual recognition to come into effect? Thanks, that, that's the, the million dollar question. <laughs> and uh, I won't put Catherine on the spot, but uh, the Law Society of England and Wales and, and indeed all of the other professional and regulatory bodies across the UK are, are incredibly keen on this. Um, that's partly why we have agreed these bespoke regulatory dialogue provisions. And um, of course, you, you can't uh, put an exact timeline on these things. It depends on, on how the negotiations go and how um, much progress is made between the relevant regulators. But, but clearly the text instills some, some sense of momentum. We've got a commitment there that, that talks about the dialogue providing to the working group uh, a report on the progress of, of these discussions no later than 20 months after the date of entry into force, so that, that instills a, a bit of pace. Um, but we also know that, that these discussions are, are uh, at least sort of at the preliminary stage and, and there are existing relationships between the Law Society of England and Wales in particular and, and their counterparts uh, in the Law Council of Australia. So look, I, I can't say that you know there's going to be um, a specific time or date when, when any agreements, you know, whether it be mutual recognition arrangements or, or something else, come into force, that, that's not within my my power to say, um, but certainly, you know, there's the, the ambition and the will on both sides to, to make progress on this. And is with visas, do health checks and biometrics, proof funds and health insurance apply to both countries? Thanks, Joanne. So um, a bit of a complicated question, um, but essentially, um, each country will maintain whatever their visa requirements are as part of that, uh, as part of the FTA. Um, the FTA just simply seeks to sort of bound that access so they can't sort of claw it away in the future. Um, so, for example, um, many of the UK's visa requirements, um, which are better placed to sort of talk about than talk about Australian ones, um, but you know we have certain um, salary thresholds which are not. Um, which are a purpose really for a, a test on seniority. You know, this is for highly skilled business persons. Um, so having a, a sort of level of salary indicates if that person is, is um, senior uh, or not. Um, so all of those things will still uh, be at play, but uh, sorry, I can't talk about the specifics of um, each visa class. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, is healthcare one of the sectors where it will be easier for people to move uh, from the UK to Australia? Um, so um, I would have to come back to you on um, what the provisions are on healthcare. It's normally um, slightly a, a contentious point in trade agreements, um, but that is definitely one that I can uh, pick up and take away. Okay, good. Um, another question we've got... Um, um, I work, in the, I work in the UK Australian income tax space out of London. Can I hire non-British citizens currently working in Australia to come and work in the UK? Uh, could you repeat that question? Sorry, Joanne. Okay, that's all right. Uh, this is someone who works um, in the UK Australian income tax space out of London. 
uh, can I hire non-British citizens currently working in Australia to come and work in the UK? So um, under this FTA, if um, non-Australian nationals were working in Australia, but they were a permanent resident of Australia, they would be captured. If they aren't a permanent resident of Australia, they wouldn't be captured by the terms of the deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure this is one for the panel, but I'll ask it anyway, and maybe they can direct it. Uh, will the $75,000 Australian GST annual turnover limit on sales into Australia be lifted to encourage sales? I think, yeah, I, I think you might be right, Joanna. I might be one to take away and have a look at. Um, yeah. Interesting question, but I'm sure we, we can follow up in, in writing on that one. Okay, and maybe another one for you, uh, Pete. How will agreed standards for quality, safety, environmental performances in goods and services support anticipated new trade following the FTA? Would you mind just repeating that, Joanna? Yeah, how will the agreed standards, the standards for quality, safety, environmental performances, um, et cetera, in goods and services support anticipated new trade? Okay. Um, that's fine. So I think it's, it's sort of hard to speak to environmental and good side of things um, with my sort of services focus. Um, I suppose on the services side, having those agreed standards um, and commitments is, as I mentioned, it's sort of about bringing up the standards almost um, as sort of a, I don't know, what's a good, good way of explaining it. Um, Say the WTO, um, we've, we've agreed um, the uh, joint state joint, joint initiative on domestic regulation, and that's brought a bunch of countries up to a certain level of commitments on domestic regulation. Now, for a lot of countries, those commitments are already existing, but it just breaks those in. I think in a similar way, what we're doing here with this agreement is we're, we're baking in these very these um uh, these very strong and liberal approaches to trading services. So. I think it's about supporting and just again at that point of uncertainty and very, very long term certainty at, at, at that and clarity on how businesses will be operating in a country. So you're sort of removing you know, those risk elements. So I'm sure risk advisors and insurance providers can sort of um, ad ad advise strongly on that. But again, it's still about taking you know, those, those, those concerns and worries out of our trade and service relationship. Um, I would have to sort of come back on this sort of goods, the environmental side of things. Um, and just check the question again, perhaps again in, in, in writing. But I think again, just coming back to that point on taking out risk, taking out uncertainty on, on trading services. Great, thanks, Pete. Um, this is a question from James Bunn. He's the UK president of the Institution of Engineers Australia. Um, and he says, thank you for highlighting the need for mobility and mutual recognition of chartered engineering qualifications under the World Charters. Um, it would be great if we could include the DIT team in the discussions um, between IE Australia, ICE, I Structure E, IET, and I Mechanical Engineering, uh, given the huge demand for highly skilled tech talent in Australia and the UK in the coming years. Um, do, do any of the speakers want to talk about this? I mean, we've we've had the agreement now. I mean, is it does does DIT get involved further, or is it now down to the professional bodies to sort it out? Thank, thanks, John. So, look, it, it, it's primarily down to, to be led by by the regulators, but of course, where government can provide support, can provide technical guidance, expertise, we, we are very keen to do that. We we work really closely with our colleagues at the business department who have established a bespoke team, uh, the recognition arrangements team that looks after this sort of stuff. We, we make sure that whatever we're doing in FTAs um, supports the work that that team and Bayes are doing. So we work hand in hand and very much see the sort of next step of the FTA life cycle as, as being um, you know, the implementation and the support that will come. Um, I, I, th I think I've actually just got a, a LinkedIn message from, from um, that, that attendee so we can pick up offline and, and have a yeah, chat about Yeah, okay, it good. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently waiting for permanent residency here in Australia. Do I carry on with the process or does the deal capture my visa requirements? 
So um, I'm not 100% sure on that question, but I would assume you would need to wait until you've got your permanent residency to be able to apply as a permanent resident. Um, but I am not 100% sure and we could try and find that out, but I don't know if we would know the answer as such. But I mean, questions like this, you know, the Chamber has um, quite a number of members that um, operate in, in all fields of um, professional services. So if people want to contact the Chamber, then we can put you in touch with um, some of our members who, who might be able to answer the more technical uh, questions um, on, on residency, et cetera. Um, so there's another question on... Um, are Australian executives allowed to visit UK to arrange private equity or finance for Australian projects? Um, can they be reminded how long they have to do this under the current proposal? So we've got typically investors uh, coming here or investors going to Australia. You know, how long can they go for? How long can they stay? Yeah, so um, the UK makes a commitment for investors who are coming to the UK for um, purposes of establishing in the UK. Um, they're offered a one year length of stay. Um, Australia um, offer a four year length of stay for um, UK, what they call independent executives, um, essentially an investor who is going to Australia to establish in Australia. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this can be answered, but we can certainly direct it uh, somewhere. Um, if an Australian is badly injured in the UK and not medically able to fly home, does the FTA make provisions for them to access human rights and automatic access to a court of appeal should it be necessary? Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah. I uh, a slightly tricky question um, and, and a, a world away from uh, the glorious world of empty containers and the post delivery services. Um, I'll be honest with you, um, I think that sort of falls in some um, other non trader elements of the agreement. And I think that's one I'd like to pull up in writing on, perhaps with the specific individual if, if they get in touch. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'm an Australian national. Um, highly skilled, currently living in Europe. Can I access these changes in mobility under the FTA agreement to work in the UK? Is there any requirement to be based in Australia? So the um, requirement is that you either are an Australian national or a permanent resident. Um, my understanding is wherever you are currently located wouldn't matter, just you have to be one of those two things or the UK equivalent. Thank you, Amy. And for Australian permanent residents or UK residents with indefinite leave to remain, these types of residents are subject to maximum times to be resident outside the Australia and the UK. Um, and whilst it's encouraging to include permanent residents in mobility provisions, has, has any clarity been given on how the new visa arrangements will work with the current restrictions on time away? from your country. I think under the, currently uh, you, you can't be away more than two years under a indefinite leave to remain between Australia and the UK. So uh, will this change at all, Amy, maybe? Oh, sorry, uh, we're struggling to come off mute then. Um, so we've made no changes to what is considered a permanent resident or what qualifies for different sort of categories of um, citizenship or nationality, et cetera, under the agreement. So everything would remain as is. Great. Okay. Well, our, our session's now coming to a close and I want to thank everybody for, for attending today. Um, and thank you to all our speakers who are um, happy to take any questions outside of this session. So if you email us at hello at australiachamber.co.uk, we can pass them on. Um, so I thank everybody for attending and um, it's been a great session. We've really enjoyed it. Um, and please do stay tuned to the events of the Chamber. Have a lovely day if you're in the UK and in Australia, a fabulous evening.